Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this new series of podcasts for the Goodwood Road and Racing website here at the Rolex Drivers' Mess at the 2016 Goodwood Revival. With me is a racing driver, and more importantly, his name is Brabham. And a lot of us are very, very, very uh, excited because this year's tribute is to Sir Jack Brabham. And it's totally right that it should be at Goodwood because Brabham won his first ever race when he came to Europe here at Goodwood. And in 1966, he won the last Formula One race to be held here at Goodwood. So it's absolutely right that we should be paying tribute to him this weekend. And David, it's tremendous reaction so many people coming to pay respects wonderful yeah it is um you know we were talking about earlier how you know everyone from around the world has seems to be coming for the yeah. event and you know jack meant a lot lot to a lot of people so to have everybody here to see all the cars here that have all flown in from different places um for me Obviously, it's quite an emotional thing because it's it's my father and so forth. <laughs> but um, I think it's emotional for a lot of other people as well because, uh, like I said, he did mean a lot to a lot of people. One thing that interests me is that uh, he was he wasn't a chatty man. He wasn't a man. <laughs> no, but he w he wasn't a man who put himself in front of the cameras or went out of his way to do public relations. And yet, there is a bond, isn't there? What, what do you think it was about him that sort of grabbed people's like people like that i think it's um a mindset in a way that you know dad went about his business and he did it exceptionally well but he was still a person and he still treated everybody like a person and yeah. it didn't matter who you were uh, it was uh, and i grew up with it because i remember seeing dad sort of 70 and onwards because I was five when he retired so we went back to Australia he was more probably one of the most famous people in Australia yeah, at that yeah, time yeah. and of course everybody would come up to him and talk to him and want autographs and everything and, <laughs> and as a kid I didn't quite understand what the fuss was about to be honest with you didn't mean anything to me other than my dad seems to be very popular <laughs> um, uh, but he always had time for people um, and he wasn't thinking about his image what that image should be, how he could take advantage of that image. Yeah. He was just himself. And I think that kind of ran through all of us, because if you, if you know any of us, we're all very similar uh, in, in that way. So uh, he definitely um, touched a lot of people because I think he was very open to them. I read in an interview that you did about him something really interesting, which was the time he arrived here in, in England uh, mid 1950s uh, from Australia and at the time that was quite a big thing in the sense that you know who is this guy he's done some dirt racing some sprint racing he's done some he's won a lot of races but who is he is he you know and he kind of put the cat among the pigeons a bit didn't he yeah, from what I understand, I think that, because obviously I wasn't around, but, no, 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 uh, but from what people tell me, yes, I mean, he came over as a kind of a raw Australian uh, at a time when, you know, English was very English and uh, obviously not long after the war. And, uh, you know, people had different views about Australians and, and the war and their role in it. And of course, dad was in the Royal Australian Air Force and so he, he lived and breathed it for a bit. Um, and of course he came over with a driving style which wasn't proper either yeah. you know he yeah. was a sideways guy and grew up you know he, he he did his training on on the dirts dirt oval tracks in midgets and of course he adapted that style to the to car racing which eventually kind of tapered off but it was always kind of still there i think in yeah. his driving and uh you know he was the first one that went racing to put the helmet on and be very aggressive about it. Nice as pie out, but you know, put the helmet on. He was quite aggressive, and I think he took he took racing to a different level. He was yeah, a, probably yeah. the first one to take it to that next next level in terms of professionalism and seriousness, I guess. Um, and um, I think that's true because a lot of people say it to me. Sterling Moss reckons that Jack was the toughest competitor he ever had, and coming from Moss, that's quite something, isn't it? 
Uh, those two guys have have such amazing mutual respect. Yeah. I mean, when I when I was talking to Dad um, on the farm, and we were just talking about racing, and I said, you know, I can always remember asking him, you know, who who was the best that you drove against? I mean, without a shadow of doubt, he didn't sit there and go, uh, okay. what? He just said, Moss. Um, Sterling, he said he was just so fast in anything that he drove, had massive respect for him. And I think that's, that was something nice in that era, I think, because, you know, people uh, didn't last very long in, in race cars. And you'd have to say the respect level back then was massive. Much, you know, seems to be disappeared a bit now in, yeah. in today's world. But back then there was a huge amount of respect for everybody, um, and particularly Sterling and, and my father. Actually, it's interesting because you have to look at why the people who survived did survive, don't you? Because as you say, so many people lost their lives. Mm. And I think I'm right in saying that Jack had a kind of attitude to that, didn't he? That he wasn't, you know, he didn't want to be, I think you put it, he didn't want to be a, a, a dead racing driver. No, no, I think, um, you know, he had a saying, you know, win as slow as possible. Yeah. That was his kind of motto. Um, and you can understand why in the 50s and 60s he, he would have adopted that mentality because, you know, they'd be going to a, f a funeral once a month or, or whatever. And um, that must have had a massive impact on, on the way they view them, their life and, and not what. But if you look at all the Brabham cars that Jack and Ron Turanak built, they were, they were regarded back then and still are in today's historic world, you know, safe, reliable. Yep easy to drive, yeah. easy to maintain, which was what you needed in those days. And that's why they became the biggest racing car manufacturer in the world in the yeah. 60s, you know, because everybody felt safe in them, I think, yeah. you know. The Lotuses were a fantastic manufacturer and, and they had great battles. They were a slightly different mentality, a little bit lighter. They want to try and get that speed. Um, and uh, a fantastic duel in the 60s between Lotus and Brabham, you know, fantastic. I, I th people, do, people don't often talk about the fact that he was the world's biggest race car manufacturer. I mean, that's quite something, especially when you think that when he came to England, he went to work for Charles and John Cooper, which you would do if you came from outside of England. It was the place to go to. For sure, still is. And yet, yeah. and yet within such a short time, he was making Brabham cars. And uh, I think that Charles and John Cooper finally got fed up with him because they found out that his early Brabhams were going quicker around Goodwood than the Coopers were and they thought, hey. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously I wasn't around, but I hear lots no. of stories. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, Dad demonstrated to John Cooper that he was quite an asset at the beginning. Um, and then, of course, I think what happened was he kind of um, outgrew the situation. Yeah. He, he wanted his his own manufacturer he, he he i guess he at that time he felt he could do better um and i know i was, I was listening to the interview this morning actually of hearing him on the way here uh, from a previous interview on radio um and he was sort of saying how um the um charles cooper he he was very tightly holding on to the purse string so it really restricted what they could do and i think dad felt frustrated a bit with some of that as well so he decided to um, bring Ron Turanak over, yeah. which he'd already been working with. What well, a lot of people don't realize that Ron was helping Jack even in the Cooper days, because Dad would, would draw up what he That's thought right. was needed, right. send, send it by airmail yes. <laughs> down to Australia for yeah. Ron to do the drawings of That's it, right. send them back, and then they'd make it, Dad yeah. would make it. Yeah. Um, you know, all the rear suspe all the suspension for the Coopers and things like that, you know, that, that was all part of Jack and Ron, uh, which won the World Championships in 59 and 60. Turanak told me that uh, he didn't come to England in the f immediately because he didn't want to leave his wife behind. So, so you're right, Jack, Jack used to write him letters saying, I, I want to lower the engine, how are yeah. we going to do that? Yeah. Yeah, Jack, Dad would have a bit of an idea about it, but he would he would sort of do a rough sketch. He wasn't he wasn't like Ron, which was a designer, yeah. but Dad was an engineer. And, and the combination between the two, and it's such a shame he's not here today, Ron, because you know he was very much the fabric of Brabham, yeah. um, hugely respected in our industry, and probably massively forgotten in yeah. many ways. But you know, I've always made a point of making sure that people remember him because. Um, 
he he was a, such a character if you knew Ron, uh, yeah. you know. But without Ron, Dad would never have achieved what he achieved. They were an interesting pair, actually, because neither of them were particularly chatty. <laughs> no. Um, I think it's fair to say that both of them could be a bit grumpy. In fact, as you, as you well know, Ron Dennis was Jack's mechanic back in the late 60s. And I, I spoke to Ron this week, and Ron said he, he was pretty grumpy to work for, but they all had this admiration for him. And that kind of, that kind of sums up a lot of pictures we all have of him, doesn't it? I think so, yeah. I mean, you know, he took it pretty seriously. And, and of course, you're, you're operating at that level. You need to be on it. And if people weren't, well, they had to get their act together. Um, I mean, it's interesting. Obviously, um, Ron Dennis must have learned something out of all of that because, uh, <laughs> you know, when you look at what what he's achieved yeah. since those days, yeah. which is just mind-boggling, um, all of those experiences working with Ron and, and Jack would have helped help put the, the sort of foundations down for him to do that. No question at all. In fact, he told me that... Uh, uh, Jack asked him to take the start money from the American Grand Prix down to Mexico for the next race in Mexico. So Ron did all that, looked after the money, ran the, ran the team, got the, got the cars down to Mexico. He learned, an, he, it's, he's quite open about it, he learned a huge amount from Jack in that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you look at what influence Jack and Ron had on so many people, from drivers to mechanics to engineers, um, they inspired a lot of people um, and educated them in a way uh, that the relationship with Honda back in the in the mid 60s when you know dad not only 50 years ago won the world Formula One championship he he also won the European F2 championship with Honda winning 10 races um, and and Honda um, you know kind of ad admitted at the time and probably still do where where really it was dad and Ron taught them how to win races yep um, and that, for them, was the start of something quite yep. unique in, in motorsport, yep. where obviously they went on to, to dominate Formula One for quite a number of years in the Senna Prost era. So um, the influence that, that the pair had on people yeah. was quite incredible. You, you, you went into racing quite late, but uh, you, inher you inherited the talent, that was for sure. And when you started racing, th th you must have then thought to yourself, you know, what my dad achieved is, is, is just beyond belief. I mean, he was 40 years old when he won. One, yeah. I, you know what, to be honest with you, it wasn't until I turned 40 that I really sat there and thought, wow. Yeah. You know, because I was the same age as what he was. Um, and he was still in his prime as a driver. Yeah. My prime... I felt was when I was 44 so we've all been quite late bloomers in a sense in that in that way but dad was still very much on it in 1970 and he won the first Grand Prix um, you know obviously he was on course to win another two which was Monaco where he stuffed it into the bay bales uh, on the last lap of the last corner and let Jochen Rint through and yes. then of course at, at Brands Hatch he ran out of fuel but um, on the last lap, you're coming around the last corner and Jochen got him then too. So, yeah, I mean, when you think about the manufacturer side of Brabham as yeah. a race car manufacturer, uh, phenomenal. Um, to, to do what he had to do in terms of testing all the cars, all the development, and then getting in the car and racing against really more professional drivers because, you know, Clark and Hill and yeah, yeah, the, Jackie Stewart, they were, they were all pro drivers as yeah. such. They and weren't doing what well. dad, and younger, and weren't doing what dad was doing and all what was on his plate. So I, I really have no idea how he managed all of that. No. When, when we all gather on the grid here this weekend to remember him, can you guess what he might be thinking? I mean, I wonder what he'd say. Well, hey, we know I just did it. That's what I... <laughs> well, I know one thing, he'd be chuffed. He would? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah no, he'd be so proud um, of seeing all the cars and all the people because he loved all that. You know, he loved going back and seeing all, all the cars when he came back to Goodwood. And the people, you know, the sport is about the people as well as much as it is about the cars and, and the relationships that we build um, as we go through our careers. So... Um, I know he'll be looking down and going, yeah, cool. It's quite funny because when he came to race here at the Revival, 
and he had that accident in the Formula One race with Jackie Oliver. Yeah. Uh, Charles March asked me to take his helmet and his stuff to the hospital. And I knocked on the door and I heard this, yeah. And I went in and I said, um, so Jack, I've brought you, yeah. That's the worst accident I've ever had in my whole career. I know, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that was, I mean, I, was, I wasn't here. I was actually racing at the Petit Le Mans and uh, I happened to win the race and woke up in the morning to a phone call saying, oh, your father's in hospital. It's like, what? What do you mean he's in hospital? You know, yeah, he's just had the worst accident he's ever had in his life. I'm going, what? You know, that must be pretty bad. And then I, I saw some footage of it afterwards. Yeah, I mean, that was a nasty accident. Um, could have easily been a lot worse. Uh, but he lived through it like he lived through a lot of the other stuff and got, got through to a right old age of 88, which is pretty incredible. Now let's talk about the future for a few minutes because I think we all really want Project Brabham to succeed. Why do we want to? Because the name is such a big deal, okay? And, and, and obviously for you it's very important. I mean, you've spent a lot of time and I presume money making sure that you hang on how do we put it to the rights to the name so t tell us tell us you know what you're doing how you're how, how this is going forward well obviously there's such an amazing legacy of Brabham yeah. not just obviously what my father did but obviously when Bernie took over uh, with Brabham won two world championships with Nelson BK in 81 and 83 um, there's such rich history and it means a lot to a lot of people so it's a great brand and that's what I fought for in the German courts to get the name back under my control, um, you know, which took a long time, took about seven years to sort out. Um, but then we looked at what, what Brabham really is. I brought a, an expert in who's into branding, a guy called David Mitchell, and he, he looked at what Brabham is, interviewed lots and lots of people in the industry, outside the industry. So we ended up with a proper brand Bible because we've never had one, yeah. you know, considering it is a brand, it is a name. So I really wanted to do this properly and, it, and it's taken time to do it. Um, and then once I slowed down on my own racing, things started to accelerate more because I wanted it to. And uh, we looked at the market, we looked at what, what's out there, what's happening to, to racing with its audiences and you know, TV figures are, are struggling, not just in racing, but a lot of sports, yeah. you know, and, and the technology today is changing everybody's habits. So yeah. I want to bring Brabham back and it needs to be back as a race team. Um, but the model for racing is not an easy one, you know, the, the, everybody's doing the same thing, everyone's trying to go for the same, the same buck as such, so for us we felt there was an opportunity to do, use today's technology, having a digital platform, um, instead of Brabham coming back as a traditional race team, let's bring it back as a team that, that, that takes, that's able to generate a lot of content which is transparent, which is, you know, kind of against the law really, um, because we want to we want to do what Brabham has done. We want to inspire people. Yeah. We want to engage people. Uh, we want to educate people. Also, he was an innovator. We Absolutely, must, we, yeah. we must never forget that. No, I mean, if the brand Bible, you know, if you look at what's in it, it says Brabham's inspirational, pioneering thinking, yeah. innovation, Absolutely. engineering, and winning. You know, so everything we do in the future has to be in that in that mindset and, and message to everybody of what we're doing. So obviously bringing something new to market like that um, is not an easy one. So, you know, it's been taking some time to not only come up with a new idea, how are you gonna take this to market? How are you gonna prove the concept? And how are you gonna make money out of it to make the team sustainable and do something different? You know, so, you know, we're in the process of talking to investors uh, about it because you know it's a subscription based model so it's a revenue generator yeah. to, to keep things going and of course it takes a long time to get to find the right person that might yeah, be yeah, interested yeah. in what you're doing and see the vision because there is a bit of a risk to it because no one's done it there's not a working model um, but we, we, we're still out there trying and, uh, and you know my dad was always out there trying and, yes. and as we are as well so uh, difficult to know when it's all going to kick off uh, it could be soon it could be in a few years time we really don't know but um, the level of discussions we're having right now are a lot higher than what we had a year ago so we are making progress it's just not as quick as I would like well I, I tell you what I think as this weekend goes along and, and, you know, Jack is really, 
on everybody's lips mm. here here that just shows you the value of what you have actually doesn't it i think it does yeah and also um you know, when we did our launch for Project Brabham, you know, we did a crowdfunding campaign and we got 64 countries involved. So for us, that showed the name is still strong. Sure. Uh, and, and we've got potential to turn it into what I think is potentially a global brand that has a certain ethos and way about it. And uh, we've got a lot of potential. So we'll have to see how the future goes. But there's a lot of interesting conversations going on not just with Project Brabham, but outside of our project, because it is a brand. People are interested in potentially using the name on other things. So we'll have to see where the space ends up. And there'll be more younger Brabhams coming along, one assumes, in the future. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. We've got a kind of what they call a racing dynasty, haven't we? Because yeah. we've got three generations of Brabhams. Um, you know, my older brother, Jeff, who's here this weekend yeah. with his son, Matthew. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Matthew's been racing in the States for a number of years now and, and raced at the Indy 500, which was an amazing thing yeah. for, for him and the family to, to have that because dad raced there. Um, if you were the first guy to put one of the one of the very first people to put the engine in the back at India. That's I mean, right. Yeah. They couldn't understand what they, he was doing. No, they? They, no they didn't. They, they, they were scratching their heads a bit. But yeah, he, he changed the course of history there as well. So um, for having Jeffrey race there, I think Jeff raced at Indy 10 times. Yeah. Um, and of course, Matt's come through and he's he's got a long career ahead of him and then my son sam's just finished university only brabham to have ever gone through university <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so he's the smart one and uh of course you know he wants to he wants to resurrect his career yeah. after doing some formula ford um a few years ago and uh you know we're looking to get him into porsche carrera cup for next year got to find the money for it as normal but um you know well at least we're working on it now which is not too late i think you told me when I spoke to you recently that your dad's attitude was I decide what I want to do I plan how I'm going to do it and I do it uh, absolutely <laughs> yeah he, he, that's what he was really good at yeah. he, he was a doer you know he just got on with it um, and uh, that's what we're doing with our project we're just going on getting on with it okay well hopefully by the time um, you see this podcast with David we'll have some nice pictures of a whole grid of Brabham cars and cars that Jack drove going around the Goodwood circuit. You know what? We reckon that your dad probably drove more laps of this place than any other man because of all the testing he did here with the Brabham Hondas, the Brabham Repcos, you know, all the, and all, well, every Brabham, they came here to test, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think when he came here first, he drove a car here at Goodwood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, yeah, yeah. when yeah. he's first racing, yeah. I think his first time in the car in England was here at Goodwood. Yeah. Um, and, and that goes for Jeffrey, Gary and myself. Really? We arrive in the UK for our first time. Um, where do we end up testing? Here at Goodwood. I mean, how bizarre is that? And here we are again. And here we are again, exactly. So yeah, I mean, the, from a Brabham Goodwood relationship, and of course, you know, Dad's ashes are here as well. Yeah. So there's a real connection for us as a family towards Goodwood now. Thank you very much. Great to talk to you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Right, well, I uh, we hope you enjoyed that with David Brabham. It's, uh, we could go on for a long time because um, it's a great name, huh? It's just part of history. Anyway, we'll be back again with uh, our next victim. So stay with us. Bye-bye. <laughs> Here we go! Here we go! On the back, oh my goodness! Through they go! <laughs> How close do you want it? A pat on the back! Come on, McPint, get your finger out! Get Steve, look at this! Look at this! A pat on the back! 